Yeah. Uh, I have news for everyone. Uh, it's still spring. Um, just wanted to let you all know. Yeah, below freezing, but it's still spring. So um, today we are going to uh, spend pretty much the entire time in Rhino. Um, and pretty much for the next like four class periods, we'll just be 100% of the time uh, in Rhino doing stuff. Um, before we get started today, I think I'm going to turn the mic down just a tiny bit. Um, that seems better. Um, does anybody uh, have any questions before we begin? Hang on just a second. Um, awesome. Well, so uh, basically what I'm going to be doing in Rhino today is we're going to start sort of um, making objects and uh, we're going to be taking those objects uh, and those are objects that are relevant to the impossible object assignment. And then we're uh, probably in the next class period or so, we will get those objects into an environment and we'll start um, playing around with lighting and uh, things like that and uh, starting to sort of get into making something that's approaching um, a photorealistic rendering. They just never get any better, you know? Um, but I tried. So yeah, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna jump into Rhino and I'm gonna make a new model. Um, we're gonna be working on the same model file for all of these, uh, you know, demos, um, the next four demos. So just to kind of let you know, this is something that is going to sort of consistently build um, into something larger. So um, I'm going to go ahead and just give myself the sort of full real estate here. Um, and it looks like that's showing on screen pretty well. Uh, yeah, drop down menu. Yes, good. OK. So um, we have already uh, done sort of one object in Rhino, and um, I believe that I saved it as a twisty form. Um, so I just want to remind you that, hello, that twisty form does still exist. Um, and I think that if we uh, do things correctly, we can actually take this twisty form and stick it into our environment later. So this is kind of hanging out in the wings um, for us to maybe use later. But for now, um, I'm going to be working in this new file, which I called Untitled. Um, I'm not a huge sort of like file name person, although I would maybe give you a couple of guidelines. Um, the way that this um, Mac OS software works, um, this it does not apply to the PC version. In the PC version, you can just save uh, as you normally would, uh, save as. Um, in the Mac version, you have to rename it and then you have to move it. I ha you may ask, be asking me, why on earth would they do such thing? I literally have no idea. Um, this was a change that came into the Mac version like two or three versions ago, um, and the people from Rhino and McNeil like it, so that's why they're doing it, I guess. Um, so in any case, I'm just going to call this um, something useful, like 107 Spring 2023, and now I'm pretty much ready to go. Um, now, Rhino uh, does have an autosave feature. Um, should you depend on the autosave feature? It's kind of a philosophical question. Um, I don't know. Do you, do you like uh, do you like taking risks? <laughs> um, so uh, what, what I mean by that is that the autosave is really awesome when it works, and um, you know when you can go back to that. Uh, for example, if your computer crashes, usually you, there will be an autosaved version that is not um, too far back in the history of what you've done that you can kind of bail yourself out. Should you rely on the autosave? for sort of normal saving, uh, no. You should still save your file uh, occasionally, especially after every work session, um, because you know um, the autosave does not always capture it at the exact moment that you might want it to be captured. So, um, but if you're sort of one of those people that, um, you know, uh, maybe like, I don't know, your friends wanna go out and you just like take your laptop and like throw it off the table, um, maybe the autosave version is for you. 
Um, but in general, you would want to be a little more deliberate about you know, saving on a regular basis. I wouldn't advise throwing your laptop under any circumstances, by the way. Um, that's how bad things happen to laptops. So, um, so basically what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna get started with drawing. Um, now, today, I think that I'm going to start um, by drawing a large object. So I'm gonna draw a boat. Um, and this boat is gonna be uh, kind of like business on the bottom, uh, fantasy wings on the top. And so it's like gonna be pretty much a normal boat um, on the bottom and then we will sort of add some features to it that make it mm, maybe something more like a boat that you would ride through the skies of like, you know, the never ending story or um, whatever your sort of favorite fantasy environment you have. So when I draw my boat, I'm gonna start by actually just drawing flat curves. Um, now, you might wanna take a couple of notes here. Um, some, uh, just visual notes is sufficient. So one thing is that right now I have these um, selected and these selections that I'm making, uh, I've selected planar, smart track, and grid snap. I think we covered what the grid snap does. Uh, we probably covered both of these, but I just wanna draw your attention to the fact that these are the ones that I have enabled for this drawing task. Um, and I'll probably disable one of them at some point, just so you can see, like, this is why I'm using that, um, and this is why it's important. So um, I also have a few of my object snaps enabled. And by the way, if you're using a PC, um, I probably said this in another video, um, but if you are using a PC, uh, these uh, options should be down on the bottom bar, um, and then also these options should be somewhere on the bottom. Um, and there are those sort of quick start guides on the canvas that sort of talk about the interface differences. So the place where I'm gonna get started is I'm gonna get started in the front view. And I'm gonna use the axes as sort of like a sort of notation that maybe this is like the top of the boat. And when I talk about the boat in general, just to kind of show you what I'm going for here. Um, by the way, I, there's a reason why I'm a digital artist, in case you were wondering. Um, I used to be really good at drawing. What happened? Um, but yeah, um, so basically the boat is gonna look something like that when we're done, okay? And so this uh, flat axis is just gonna be like my sort of mark, demarking the top of the boat. So I think I'm gonna start by kind of drawing this bottom curve and I'm gonna go to a control point curve and I'm gonna um, add, I'm gonna allow like a, a few units for um, whatever this is, this sort of back piece. Um, so probably maybe I'll start here and then I'm just gonna make a couple of curve nodes here and then I'm gonna take this all the way to the front of the boat. Um, you might be asking yourself, why am I using zero, zero in this way? Not really any reason, but it makes it super easy if I need to rotate things later. Um, so it's mostly just for convenience. Okay, so there's that. And then um, I can go ahead and make a, a curve that goes from here. And notice that I'm using my object snaps to pick up this endpoint right here. And then I'm actually gonna draw the curve in the right view because I might not be able to select it in the, in the right view. Um, so that's just you know, kind of a fun technique. And maybe like right there. Um, so just looking at this in the perspective view, um, I can tell already it looks a little deep um, but I think we can basically, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna get all of the curves in here and then we can kind of play around with them. So probably I could go ahead and adjust it now um, and I could grab these two uh, curve points. So if I turn the curve points on, I can do that by clicking here and maybe just adjust this curve point up uh, a little bit. 
You can see right now that my object snaps are kind of fighting with me a little bit, like it's not snapping um, to the area that I want. So that's kind of a pretty normal thing. Um, what I'm gonna do uh, when I make that adjustment, first of all, I'm gonna hit Control Z. I'm gonna disable my object snaps. And I'm also gonna put this in, into ortho. And by putting this into ortho, it's gonna limit the movement of this curve point to a, uh, basically straight up and down. Um, and so that can be very useful. Um, straight up and down or 90 degrees. Um, and then I can take this other curve point and just drag it up there. And then I think I said the boat was too deep. This boat literally looks like it's about to burst. So I'm just gonna kind of move these two curve points. You can move multiple curve points at the same time. And it can be a really powerful way to just like shift shapes around. <coughs> Pardonnez-moi. So, okay, so now I've made those like slight adjustments. At this point, I can probably turn the curves off. So I can do that by um, hitting control and then this thing, or I can fly out the menu and select the points off option. Um, what I would really like is if the back of the boat had a sort of symmetrical um, shape here. So why would I sort of struggle with making this thing perfectly symmetrical when I can just take one half and flip it over and done? Um, so in order to do that, I'm gonna go up here to the transform menu and I'm going to mirror my curve. And then it asks me to select an axis and so I just want something that's on this kind of straight line in the right view. Um, so I could even just use the zero, zero here. And it can be really any point. Uh, it could just be one point, um, as long as you're basically just telling it the direction to flip in. Okay, so now I have that flipped over. Now, I think the last thing that we need to do to kind of get this into something looking like a boat hull is we're gonna have to think about these side curves. Um, and so for these, I would also use the control point curve tool. And I would start at the top of the back so that everything's kind of joined together. Um, you might notice uh, that right now, it looks like it's snapping to the grid if you look at the top view. Um, so even though it looks like it's in the right position in the right view, it, it is not. It's, um, and that's pretty common. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna turn the object snaps back on. And I have the end point selected. So that is gonna allow me to just snap straight to this. Um, so getting comfortable with the snaps, I think are probably like the number one thing that you can do to increase your chances of success in Rhino. Um, for example, right now I still have things in ortho mode. Um, and you can see when I'm in ortho mode, it only allows me to either go straight up and down or back and forth on a 90 degree angle. Well, I'm making a curvilicious boat right now, so that's not super useful, right? So I should definitely turn off ortho for doing this, and that gives me the range to sort of click anywhere. Um, I also do want to keep planar enabled right now. Um, so I'll show you uh, an example of what it looks like if I don't use planar. Um, and you'll be able to sort of see how that looks. Um, so at this point, I'm just going to hit enter because I'm done with that. And you can see right now my curve turned out nice and flat on the top, which was actually how I wanted it. Um, Let's do it sort of the wrong way, uh, which could be the right way if you're maybe trying to do things a little bit differently. I'm gonna grab this end point here. I'm gonna disable planar. And then, uh, you might get something like that. Now, um, getting something like that, that's, you know, a lovely curve it's there's not necessarily anything wrong with that it's just not what I want for this particular instance um, but knowing whether you want to have a planar curve or not is kind of a good thing to know um, I guess what would be the major difference well some of the methods that we would maybe use to create surfaces along these curves will only work with planar curves some of them will work with any kind of curve um, so those are just things that you know 
good to think about. So in this case, I'm going to take this planar curve that I made, and I'm going to flip it like we did before. So that is a transformation here. And I'm going to go for the mirror transformation. And I think I like doing it over here. So now we have something sort of resembling a boat. Um, and sort of the next sort of step is for us to kind of fill in uh, all of these surfaces. Now there's one more line that we should probably have, and that is that it would be nice to kind of just uh, shore up this line in the back here, right? Um, so that I can do with just my uh, regular polyline tool. Even just a regular line would work. And for the start of the line, I just want to make sure that I'm clicking on the right points. So this is a great situation for using those object snaps. And I want to go from this point to this point. Now, um, you might also be asking, I probably have said this like, or will say this like 100 times, um, why is it so important that I use the object snaps? Um, because basically, if we didn't use the object snaps when we were creating this, and we went to make a surface out of these lines, it would laugh at us. Um, mostly, that is why. So um, let's go ahead and do that. Let's create a surface. So these sur um, curves in the back are probably the simplest. Um, they're completely planar. Um, how can you know if something's planar? Um, you kind of don't. Um, you can look to see um, in the viewport, you know, it looks pretty planar. It probably is. So uh, I'm going to make this surface by using the planar curves method right here. OK, that's good. And uh, now when I'm getting into working with surfaces, it's probably a pretty good time to uh, double tap in some blank area of the screen and go over to where it says, uh, go I'm just going to use the ghosted viewport. But you could use other viewports or other viewport rendering modes as well. Um, but this I like because it gives me a way to sort of see what's filled in or what's the surface and what's not, right? Um, so also uh, here we could go ahead and do these two surfaces. So we've got a couple of um, curves that we have to fill in here. So it looks like this surface, we could use these two and then we could also use this sort of half curve right here. Now, this is going to be kind of interesting. Um, could we use the planar curves method for this situation? No, uh, these curves are not planar. So a good method for creating surfaces when you have non-planar curves is to use the method called edge curves. Um, and that's in the same menu. It's right above planar curves. Um, and it basically just kind of stretches a surface uh, around those, those curves. And then, let's see, we could certainly do that for the other curve if we wanted to, or we could just take this surface and flip it. Totally, I don't think it really matters. I'm going to flip it, just because it's a little more straightforward. So, okay, yay. So we have something like a boat. Um, I don't know about you, but I mean, I've been on uh, several boats. I am from Florida. And uh, boats tend to have a little more detail than this. So um, one th a couple of things that I'd like to do. Um, I'm feeling that this is definitely like in the kind of rowboat category of a uh, boat. It's not like a speedboat. It's not a weekender. It's not a yacht. Um, this is like the kind of boat that you would just grab a couple of oars and like sit on a bench in the middle and, you know, mess around on a lake. Um, so to that end, I feel like there's a few things that I'd like to maybe add uh, to this. I'd like to put a rim around the top, um, and then I'd like to put some sort of a bench in the middle, um, and we can kind of look at ways to do that. So the rim on the top is going to be not super hard. So uh, what I would need to do for that is I basically need to take this sort of top um, curve. There's three curves right now that are in the top. 
I could join these into a single curve. That might be a nice thing to do. I don't think it's strictly necessary, but sure, we could join this into one single curve. Now it says three curves joined into one closed curve. Just makes it a little bit easier to select and deal with. Um, and then the next thing that we could do to sort of get this rim going is we will need to, um, and you might notice that I am an obsessive uh, repositioner of my objects. That's because I really like to see what I'm doing and that's pretty much the only way that you can do that um, is by constantly just like re-aiming your view, right? Um, so what we have is basically a two-dimensional curve here. Um, and if you can see it in this view, it's completely flat. Um, so we're gonna deal with this as if it's a two-dimensional curve. It does so happen that there's a function in Rhino called curve offset, which will take this curve and it will draw a curve inside of the curve that is at a fixed distance, right? So if we come in here to um, offset curve, it will uh, give us a side to offset and we'll, we'll set that for the interior. And then it gives us a distance. And so let me just double check my units for a second here. So I'm one unit over. Okay, so one of these small squares is one unit. So probably that looks like a little bit minimal. I was hoping for it to be a little larger. So maybe I'll go for three. That looks much better. Um, you'll notice that I do have these little intersections, which we, uh, little intersections which we can deal with uh, later. Right now, this uh, little option right here is set to trim, so hopefully it will actually deal with those intersections um, and get rid of them, but, uh, you know, cross your fingers. So I went ahead and enabled it, and it looks like it got rid of the small intersections, but it didn't necessarily, oh no, it did get rid of all the intersections. That was, um, what I was seeing, this line right here, I thought it was part of that curve set, but that's actually part of the hull of the boat. So what it generated for me is absolutely perfect. Um, it's basically a smaller version of the hole that was there, um, and it's you know been all sort of trimmed and all the intersections have been cut out. So if I grab this curve and the larger curve, um, I should be able to uh, do uh, planar curves on this. So that worked quite well. Um, and you might notice this is a fun thing about planar curves. If you give it, if you give the planar curves function two curves that have uh, a hole inside of them, it will sort of see around the hole and it will give you an object with a hole. Um, so that's kind of nice. Um, and that actually most of the tools in Rhino that are surface creation tools will, will basically like not fill holes, which is nice. So now I've got this thing going and that was pretty straightforward. I mean, I guess relatively speaking. Um, what would be nice would be to take a sort of like a rectangle and just float it over this surface. So that sounds like it might be uh, pretty straightforward, but um, guess what? It's actually not as straightforward as you might think. Um, why? Uh, well, because uh, these are sort of curved shapes, and so I think let's go ahead and try to draw uh, a polyline here. So um, I'm gonna draw a polyline from, because it's snapping to this point right now, I'm gonna go from midpoint to midpoint right there. And then I'm gonna take another polyline and I'm trying to figure out the best way to make this precise. Um, probably the best thing to do in this case, so this is just like a little um, thing. I want, to, I want to make sure that if I draw a polyline that I have a point here that's at a very fixed and specific distance, like maybe you know, six or seven units, and that then this point is also six or seven units away. So probably the easiest way to do that would be to cut and paste this uh, line and move it backwards 
hit it, I'm gonna hit the shift key so I move it on ortho. And um, then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take this uh, object and I'm gonna adjust the points so that they move to the, that very specific little intersection spot. Um, and for this, I might want to activate my intersection snap um, just so this comes in like exactly right. Um, and that's sort of my way, my little way of keeping everything straight. Um, could you do it differently? There are, as, just like with Photoshop, there's like five kerbillion ways to do something. Um, but now I have basically what I wanted. I have these two lines that are sort of hanging out, waiting to be surfaced. Um, I also have these little lines, um, which if I'm lucky, um, I will be able to only use the portion of the line that is intersecting with these two. So let's go ahead and give that a shot. I'm gonna do a planar curves. So um, it asks me to select the planar curves. I'm gonna select the surface edge rather than the curve for this particular thing. Um, and I'm just gonna see what that does. Nothing, that's fun. Um, so then probably what I would go ahead and do is I basically need to generate these little side curves. Um, this is one of those things where Rhino can become kind of fussy. Um, and I'm gonna go ahead and show you how to do it just because I feel like it's something that we actually want to do. So if I take this curve, um, and basically what I want, if, if in case anybody's like not clear, what I'm looking for is the tiny curved segment that's in between the two straight lines. So how can I get that? Well, one way would probably be to split that curve. Um, and so there's a split function. It's right next to the trim function. Um, I'm not using the trim function because I actually don't want the object to get deleted. Um, so if I use the split cutting objects, that would be these two rails. And then I should have Okay, so yeah, so that did generate this tiny curve. Can everyone see that? Yeah. So I'm just gonna do it again on the other side. Um, and one of the things that you wind up doing in Rhino a lot is, oh cool, it did both sides, awesome. Um, you, uh, you wind up making things from other things, right? Um, so definitely like, taking a shape, splitting it up, taking those segments, making something else out of them is, you know, just one of like a really common operation in Rhino. So I'm basically gonna select all four of these curves and now because the curve has like a boundary and it's closed, uh, it should work. Usually when you, if you bring an object together like that looks something like this, like let's say you, basically did just what we did where you wanted to go for this square, but this square also had a couple of other curves hanging off of it. Those curves hanging off of it are like a liability and they will tend to make things go wrong for you. Um, so in general, like my advice is to have like a, clo you know, a closed curve tends to work much better, um, which is what we're lo basically looking at here. So if we do planar curves now, that gives us exactly what we're looking for. Now, probably a slightly easier way to have done what we just did would have been to just take a rectangle and then use the split or trim to trim off the corners. Um, six of one, half dozen the other. Um, but yeah, this is basically what we're looking for here. And one thing that I wanna go ahead and do is just give this a tiny bit of dimension um, along with this top surface. So we've got two surfaces here, and what I'm gonna do is right now these surfaces are sort of paper thin and you know, maybe only theoretical. So I'm gonna take these two surfaces and I'm just gonna extrude them, I don't know, like an inch or something, some small amount, like a piece of wood. It's probably about an inch or three quarters of an inch. 
So I can do that from the solid menu because we're working with surfaces. Um, usually this, um, by the way, these menus that are sort of set up as sur curve, surface, solid, there, it's a little bit counterintuitive because like right now we are working with surfaces, but we need to go to the solid menu because we, will, we want to have solids as the result. So that's how the menus are organized. It's not, it's not what you're working with at the time, it's the result that you want. Um, so in this case, we can do extrude surface uh, straight and uh, we'll just pop it up a tiny bit. Perfect. Um, that's a little, maybe a tiny bit beefy, but it'll be fine. Um, so one of the reasons why I wanted to go ahead and extrude these into surfaces, uh, two re or extrude them into solids, two reasons. One reason is because I am gonna take like a giant uh, narwhal horn and I'm gonna uh, bisect the, um, the uh, bench part with this narwhal horn, okay? Um, so, because I want to basically take this narwhal horn, which I haven't made yet, and uh, stick a hole, you know, stick it through the boat, um, I need a solid to do that. And then, also, uh, it just looks cool. Hmm. So, um, yeah, narwhal horn, I think I just said that. Um, so, pretty much, uh, we are, yes, looking towards making a narwhal horn. I don't know why I've just been obsessed with narwhal horns. And by the way, if you go up onto the capital, um, you know, the square, they have all these like really awesome planters with giant narwhal horns. Check it out. You may have never noticed them. Um, so in order to make a narwhal horn, we're basically making like a, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take like a wobbly shape and I'm gonna turn it into a big cone and then we're gonna twist it up, okay? So if I started with a circle, by the way, and I made it into a cone, and then I twisted it, um, what would happen? Literally nothing. Nothing. Um, yeah, you can't really twist a, a symmetrical cone. So just all that to sort of say that we're going to make something that is, um, really sort of meant to be, I'm using this as a size reference also, this sort of one cell of this thing. And I'm gonna start here. I'm sort of drawing it in a position where it can be dragged into the, um, into the object. But I'm basically making just this like really simple kind of blobby form. Okay, there's my blob. It is literally a blob. And uh, now, so I wanna turn it into this like big like thing, right? This big tall thing. So there's a bunch of ways for me to do that. Probably the best way to do that would be to go up to the solid menu that we were in and go directly from a planar curve to a solid, which is the thing you can do. So if I go to the planar curve and I can extrude it to a point, um, that would be probably really useful. I'm gonna do myself like a very small favor before I do that operation though. And I'm gonna draw a line um, that is roughly where I want it to be. And just to kind of give myself some reference so that I have something to snap to um, when I go ahead and do this for real. And it looks like I missed the center of the object just a tiny bit, so I'm gonna, um, my object snaps are on right now and I don't really want them to be. I'm just kind of moving it to where I think it should be. Um, probably I actually wanna start all the way up here. Okay, so basically I'm just gonna show you in perspective view what it looks like. Um, it looks fine. Um, I could probably spend a couple more minutes just like getting it exactly into the right spot. Um, let me go ahead and do that just because I wanna start off with like 
the right, um, yeah. Okay, so that looks uh, much more helpful, and it does seem like there's, it's not quite straight up and down, so let me. Okay, you know what? That is totally, like it's not perfect, but it's totally fine. Um, so basically what I have here is just like a, what in Rhino speak would be called like a rail, and it's just a, a reference point to myself to sort of know like where this thing should end, right? Because um, do I need it? Not strictly speaking, like I could just interactively push it up and say, okay, that's far enough. Um, but if you're using snaps and doing that kind of stuff, it's nice to actually have something there to snap to. So um, yeah, let's do it. I'm gonna go to make that planar curve uh, to a point. And let's see. Of course, I had the rail curve selected, so I have to actually select the planar curve, which would make sense. And then I'm gonna push it up to a point. And so, as I said before, that's when it becomes kind of nice to have this to snap to. Of course, in order to snap to it, you have to enable your object snaps. Um, bonk, there we go, perfect. Um, and so you can see right now, um, it's basically this uh, sort of blobby shape that is heading towards um, a sort of singular point here, right? So what we wanna do now is we wanna basically take this and we wanna twist it a lot. So I'm gonna go over here to the transform menu. I know we've done twist before. Um, so you can select objects to twist. And then it asks you for the start of the twist axis. Hey, guess what? We just happen to have a, a straight line there for us to use. So that's kind of convenient. And then um, you also, oh no. Oh, I misclicked. Sorry, y'all. I just want to be able to see this part of it. Um, okay, start of twist axis. Yes, I want the end of this line and end of twist axis would be the end of this line. And then you get to do it in two dimensions. So here, I would basically start here. And I want this to be quite twisty. So um, I'm gonna just kind of like go around like several points. Um, I'm actually gonna turn off my object snaps right now um, just because they're really distracting. So I'm just kind of moving around in a circle trying to get it to where I want it to be. Um, I think I'm gonna press um, the infinite option and just see if that helps me get it a little bit tighter. There we go. So, so this is a little bit, um, it's a little less smooth than I would normally do, but I mean, it looks cool. Um, you know, normally with like, you know, a narwhal horn, I would just use a less irregular shape to start with, but you don't want it to be so uh, regular that it's a circle, because then when you twist it, not, you know, nothing will happen. Um, so at this point, and this is kind of where, like, you know, we're headed in the next, um, so next little while, we can take this object now and kind of move it into uh, being with our boat here. And I'm just gonna kind of do that interactively. Um, do we need it to sort of like touch the bottom of the boat? Not, not really, but um, I mean, I guess that would be nice. Um, I'm gonna move it so that it intersects with this thing. And I think I will just get, kind of give it a look and get it so that it roughly touches the bottom of the boat. Um, and now you can see it's pretty much where I want it to be. Um, and so like I could sit on that side and you could sit on that side. Um, 
But yeah, we'll get into sort of like working with materials and working with other ways of kind of dealing with this. Oh, I see it's poking through, so that's, that's too far. Um, let me just get it up a little bit there. Um, so one of the reasons that I made this into a, uh, a solid, this bench, is that I thought it would be really fun uh, to show you all what you could do with solids. So right now, I make a big deal about solids, right? So this is why. <laughs> Um, so one thing uh, that we have here is we have two solid objects. We have this narwhal horn, which is a solid, because I used the solid menu to create it. And then we also have this um, sort of plank that goes across the center of the boat. So with any two solids, um, provided that they're not super messed up, which of course happens, um, with any two solids, you should be able to do what's called Boolean operations. And Boolean operations are basically ways of uh, applying a certain logic to objects to say this but not that, that but not this, this pokes a hole in this, that pokes a hole in that, right? So we'll go over all of those situations right now. Now, just to be clear, what I'm looking for here is I'm looking for um, the, I'm looking for the narwhal horn to poke a hole in the uh, boat object. That's what I'm looking for, okay? Now, probably it would be nice if when this happened, it didn't delete my narwhal horn because I actually kind of want it to stick around, right? Um, but we'll get into that. So if you go to the solid menu and you go to Boolean 2 objects, um, you can basically click in any part of the screen and it will click through all the different ways that you could combine these objects together. So here's the scenario that I just described. Nope, it's not quite. There it is. Um, so here's the scenario where the horn sort of pokes a hole in the object or in the rectangle, right? Um, there's also gonna be scenarios where the rectangle pokes a hole in the horn, right? Um, so you can basically click through all of these different scenarios and sort of wait for the one you want. And then when you get the one you want, you can hit enter. Now, I'm gonna do this one more time because what I actually want is I want it to poke a hole through this, but I want it to not delete either of these things. Um, so that's just a quick little setting in here. So if you go to Boolean 2 objects, and then you can click through the Boolean results. Mm. Interesting. So um, it looks like it did not sort of um, allow me to save those uh, objects. So the workaround there would be to just uh, obviously like cut and paste them before you get started. So let me do that. And then I'll apply the Boolean to objects. And that should be it. And so now if I click on this, the copy of this, um, Hang on just one second. Got a tiny bit turned around. Da, 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 da. Okay, so I'm gonna just make sure that we get this. So, Boolean two objects, yes, uh, that, press enter, and then I can move these, um, whoop, I'm gonna move these both at the same time. Now, this is kind of like a special situation. So I really want to move these so that they are in exactly the same place as what was here, right? So most of the time that we've been doing moves, uh, we've been moving just by dragging things around. That's hugely limiting because you can't get it like in precisely the right place. So if you do use the move function, which is right here in Rhino, 
you can take it from one point, like right here, which is an identifiable point, and then you can move it exactly back into the place that it's supposed to be. Um, and that is sort of what exactly what we're looking for here. So I want the version that's not cut to go away. And then I have this version that is cut, which is still remaining. Now, you might be asking, why didn't you just let it intersect? Um, hey, that's a fair question. Um, <laughs> because I wanted to show you how to do this, I guess. But um, if you are getting into like 3D printing and fabrication, um, intersections are something that are really to be avoided. Um, so probably just to kind of like honor people that might want to do that. Um, but we have this thing now, and so it's like as close to perfect as they get in Rhino. Um, not that we're striving for perfection by any stretch of the imagination. Um, but uh, yeah, it's pretty much where I want it to be. Um, when we come back uh, on Monday, we will start sort of like building like a place for this boat to live in. Um, I definitely want to give it some, I don't know, like insect wings or something, and then we might consider uh, fun things you can do with lighting. Um, so yeah, that's pretty much uh, some, a lot of uh, shape creation tools in Rhino. So um, yeah, have a fantastic weekend. I, I hope it stays above freezing for you. So do I. <laughs>
Um, I am uh, in the science hall, and I, I returned the microphone before I uh, finished my recording on lecture capture. And now it's like asking me, I, I'm caught in some limbo. <laughs> Um, no, well, no, I unplugged it because I thought that would help, but hang on. Just.